This is Real Estate Rookie episode 288. Ash, outside of credit score, what other kind of factors do you typically look at when screening for long-term tenants? Yeah, let me give this disclaimer first, is that make sure you know what you can and cannot screen for with your state laws. So, I mean, every state has different rules on this as to what you can screen for. Uh, So screening also costs money. So you have to pay, if you're doing a background check, if to make sure, you know, no violent crimes have been committed. If you have a multifamily unit, your tenants are not going to be wanting to live next to someone who is convicted of murder um, and just out of jail. My name is Ashley Kerr, and I am here with my co-host, Tony Robinson. And welcome to the Real Estate Rookie Podcast, where every week, twice a week, we bring you the inspiration, motivation, and stories you need to hear to kickstart your investing journey. And like, we're, we're back with another Rookie Reply episode. We've got some great questions today. We're going to talk about why Ashley's first eviction had her in tears and what you can learn from that process to make sure you don't end up the same way. We're going to answer the questions, do evictions and bad credit scores always lead to bad tenants, or is there a silver lining in there somewhere? And last, we're going to talk about what a DSCR loan product is and how you can use it to fuel your funding for your real estate business. You forgot to add in the part where a a tenant leaves a note as to why she's leaving the unit that also leaves you in tears. (laughs) Yeah, but those are good tears. I know, I know. Yeah, Um, yeah, so today's episode, we go through these questions. As always, Rookie Reply is your chance as our listener to send in your questions for us to answer. Uh, You can... Send your questions to the Real Estate Rookie Facebook group. You can send a DM to Tony or I, or you can leave some questions on to our YouTube videos. Just search Real Estate Rookie and make sure you are subscribed. Okay, so our first question today is from Dan Rodriguez. And I took a look at this question and I said, oh, great. Another opportunity for me to talk about how I cried on the podcast. So today's question is, for those of you that have gone through the eviction process, did you go it alone in small claims court or did you hire a lawyer? Local court has advised me of the steps needed. I'm just wondering if I should spend the extra money despite already being at a loss with a problem tenant. The guy already has a bench warrant for repeated failure to show for driving with suspended license, so I'm pretty sure judgment is paper value and I'll never recover nothing from it. Can I just, I just want to ask before you answer that, Ashley, because it, I wonder if Dan's question, it seems like he's just more so worried about trying to recover maybe lost rental revenue and not necessarily evicting him. Because I mean, just he said, wondering if I should spend the extra money despite already being at a loss with the with the problem tenant. But if that tenant's still in the house, then you should definitely spend the money. I don't know. Just how how are you reading that question? So I you could go, and I, this probably varies from state. So I've done New York eviction, so I'll speak on terms of that. But it has been a while since I've actually done one myself. So I think right here are two different. Um, questions that he's asking are two different scenarios. So the first one is the eviction process. And then the second one is filing a judgment against someone. So these can be done simultaneously or they can be done separately. Uh, So let's take the scenario that the person is still living in the house and they want to do the eviction plus file a judgment against the person. Or you could just file the eviction and not even go with the judgment. But with the eviction process, you can do it yourself, but you just have to be so diligent. I did two evictions. My first ever that I did, the investor I was working for said, we don't need to hire an attorney. You learn everything. You can learn how to do this process. So at court, judge made me cry because I didn't file at the timelines and I messed up the or like when you serve the person has to be a third party. You have to have them sign an affidavit. Then you have this much time before you can file the next one. But the next thing to them has to be filed within three days or whatever. You know, it's a very time stricken process. And if you don't know what those time periods are that you need to hit, the judge can throw the case out of court. Luckily, it was in a very small town. I there was nobody else in the courtroom except for me and the tenant. And for the next case, she, you know, excused the first tenant. It was like you know, please go ahead and uh, go and, you know, we have to, she'll have to redo the eviction or whatever. So she tells like the, the bailiff or whoever's the only other person in the room is like, don't bring the next person in yet. And she says to me, 
I'm just going to dismiss this for you. I'm not going to say the reasons why. So you don't have to go through the embarrassment a second time. Something along those lines. I don't remember the exact words. It's basically that. But um, yeah, so they, I was like, please let me hire an attorney to the investor. So since then, I haven't done any evictions myself and always hire an attorney to do it because they know the process and they can do it so much faster than you can. Um, there's also a certain language that has to be appropriate in the documents that that are filed. So, for example, in New York, you have to give a 10 day notice for them to pay rent or to vacate the premise. Um, if they do not do either of those, then that's when you can file the petition for eviction. Um, you send it to the court. They give you a court date and then you have to serve it to the tenant by third party, get the affidavit of service, all these things. Um and then once you actually go to the go to court, it can vary vastly as to how your court experience is. So I've gone with my attorney to different um, evictions, and it, sometimes I just sit there. I don't have to say anything. Other times the judge wants to ask me a million questions. Sometimes the tenant doesn't even show up, and they make you wait 45 minutes to see if they are going to show up. So I think... Having an attorney is definitely a huge advantage. Plus, they can file the judgment for you. The judgment is a lot easier to take care of than it is the eviction. You can go to small claims court. Will you go to the, the court clerk, go to their office, and you will ask for the small claims form. You can fill out the form right there, and then um, they'll say, give you a court date, and then they'll have the marshal serve the person, and then you have your court date to do the judgment against the person. I've only done um, one judgment myself personally against someone because in the the same scenario, it's not going to really recoup anything. But one of the first tenants of my own that I had to evict, I did a judgment. It's probably been seven years now, and I think it was a 10-year judgment. So in 10 years, that judgment will expire. I've never seen a penny from it. And maybe someday I'll get a check in the mail. Yay. <laughs> but uh, until that, it's just a waiting to game. But I think if you're going to do the judgment, it's fairly easy process, at least in New York, to do the the that through small claims court. But as far as the eviction process, if you don't know what that process is, then I would definitely hire an attorney. And for an eviction that goes smoothly, I would say um, on average, I've paid a thousand dollars to have that that eviction done. But if that means that tenant is out quicker and I'm not losing two more months of rent because I messed up or I did something wrong, that is a thousand dollars well spent. Then another option is you can do cash for keys, offer the tenant like, hey, I'm gonna give you $400 if you're out by next Friday. I will come here, you have everything out, I'll give you $400, that's you know enough to help you towards a new security deposit or, you know, whatever that amount may be, that would be cheaper than going another month or two, waiting for the eviction to process, hiring an attorney, things like that. Yeah. Um, one of the benefits, obviously, of investing in short-term rentals is that you don't have to worry about uh, evictions. Um, I can't speak to to all states, but like, and this is not legal advice. So if this information is incorrect, please don't come back and try and hold me liable. But um, I've been told that in California that um, as long as the stay is less than seven days, they never obtain tenant rights. And the majority of our properties in, 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 in California, they turn about every two days or so. So we never have to really worry about someone potentially needing to be evicted. And honestly, we had one situation where we, we had to call the local sheriffs and they were more than happy to show up at the property and help escort that guest off of the, off of the property. So it, it's super easy with a short term rental to, uh, get a tenant out if you, uh, if you need to. But obviously every state is going to kind of vary. So make sure you understand the laws in your, your kind of local state as well. And I actually looked it up and it says that not only is it, um, seven nights, but if a guest stays, um, 14 days within a six month period, then they also get a uh, tenant, right? So if someone booked, you know, two or, or three, six day stays or something like whatever, whatever the math adds up to in a six month period, then they get tenant rights. And I actually didn't know that. So that's good to know as well. If we see the same name popping up, um, that could be a, a cause for concern as well. Okay. Let's move on to our next question. This is from Tam Vo. When tenant screening, I know credit score isn't the only thing that matters and pulling credit helps to see their payment history. 
what credit score range would you accept for B neighborhood, C neighborhood? What else do you look for? So I think a big consideration on this, and I think you're definitely on the right track, Tam, is knowing what kind of class neighborhood you are in. If you are renting an apartment in a C neighborhood and you're requiring a 700 credit score, you're most likely not going to get that. Where if you're doing high-end luxury units, you're more able to get the tenant that has that high credit score that is choosing to rent instead of um, purchasing a property. Because a majority, and not all renters, of course, are renting because they can't afford or don't have the credit to actually purchase a property. So that is you know, part of your tenant pool that you don't want to, I guess, for say, um, leave out because you're setting your standards so high as for the tenant that you're going to let occupy the property. Um, so as far as like the range to accept for a B and C neighborhood, I really don't have a good answer. Um, I will say that a lot of the units I have are in B neighborhoods and we accept a 600 or above credit score for those areas. Yeah. Ash, outside of credit score, what other kind of factors do you typically look at when screening for long-term tenants? Yeah. Let me give this disclaimer first is that make sure you know what you can and cannot screen for with your state laws. So in New York State, I think it was June 2019, they passed a law that you cannot deny someone because of their eviction history. So you can find out if they were evicted, but you cannot deny them for that reason. I did not know that. Ridiculous. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, every state has different rules on this as to what you can screen for. Uh, So screening also costs money. So you have to pay if you're doing a background check, if to make sure, you know, no violent crimes have been committed. If you have a multifamily unit, your tenants are not going to be wanting to live next to someone who is convicted of murder um, and just out of jail. So There are things that you can screen for. The biggest thing is make sure you are consistent with your screening. Build out what your criteria is. What do you require of every single tenant so you don't get yourself in trouble with fair housing laws? Um, Another thing, so doing the credit check, the background check, that is a big thing. Some states doing the eviction check, um, having references. So with references, it's very easy for somebody to put their friend on the application and say, yes, they were my previous landlord. So that's where as real estate investors, it um, you know can come in handy that we have access to finding who owns certain properties. So if you really want to go the extra mile and screening your tenant, you know, wherever they put their previous address, you know, go on PropStream, the GIS mapping and see who actually owns that property that they are saying was their landlord. Um, or if they have a, you know, ask for the property management company that managed it um, and get that number directly, or you can Google it to verify that is the number if they give you a property management company. Just, I guess, Ashley, have you ever had an experience where on paper, a tenant was probably someone that you shouldn't have rented to, but maybe they had not a sob story, but they, you know, they, they had a story for you as to why they were deserving and how their, you know, past isn't indicative of their future. And you end up renting to that person and it ends up being a nightmare. Has that happened to you before? I've actually had it go both ways. So I had one tenant, it was the first property I ever bought on my own without a partner. And this was the first, I just closed on it. It was rent ready, ready to go. And I didn't have a ton of people that came to showings. And I, instead of waiting to find the rent right tenant, I became desperate and I rented to a a young girl and her boyfriend and her boyfriend didn't pass the the screening requirements. So she had somebody else co-sign for her and it went great until COVID hit. And so since March, 2020, until they were just evicted, um, October of 2022, they did not pay rent at all. They would get, um, it's called ERAP. It's a government assistance program that started during COVID where you could apply for rent payments. Well, this would only, you would apply for it, but then it would take like up to, you know, four months for it to get approved. So then they would be behind again, another four months. 
when they were finally evicted, the the place was trashed. It looked like um, they had had a child since they had first moved in. Uh, definitely looked like signs of domestic disputes, like hole punches in doors, like somebody had went in and locked the door and somebody punching, trying to get through uh, and just trash the place. I had to spend 10 grand to, to remodel it after they moved out. Um, so that right there was, I, I just, I still think back to showing them that unit, even though that was in 2017. So they paid from 2017 to 2020. And then after that, it just, it just went downhill. But I had another scenario where it was a mom and then her two teen, teenage kids. And they really, she really didn't have, um, she met the credit requirements uh, her income was just barely at the level, but she asked for her kid's income to be included, saying they would be pitching into rent. So that was kind of how we got around approving her was that she was including her teenage kids who had jobs that they would be pitching in for rent. So we did that. And she had told me that she was leaving her boyfriend that was, you know, not, nice to her and things like that. And she really gave me a sob story. And that, that time I learned like, that's sometimes a red flag is when they immediately are telling you, here's why I am moving in and reasons I might not pay rent because I'm starting all over, blah, blah, blah. She, she paid late a couple times. She lived there two years and then she put in her notice and it was the nicest I notice I'm leaving your apartment I've ever received just like the biggest thank you for giving them a chance. And she had saved enough money. She had started um, this, you know, first time home buyer program. And she actually had put a down payment on her first house that she was going to own on her own. And like that right there was like, that was a success story. That was one time where giving someone a chance really did, did work out. And I'll, I'll never forget that tenant because of that thank you note that she wrote me when she was moving out. You know, uh, as real estate investors, we get so much like heat on social for destroying communities and just being awful, terrible people. But we need to share more stories like that, you know, where you gave someone a, a second chance and they were able to use that to pretty much restart their life. And like there's, we do some good as real estate investors as well. So, so kudos to you, Ash, for, for that one. Um, cool. So b before we jump off of this question, I just want to read another review that came in. Uh, this is a five-star review on Apple Podcasts by the someone by the username of McNeil2712. And McNeil says, my brother and I have talked about getting into real estate for years. After struggling financially for years, I recently paid off all of my debt, credit cards, loans, everything except my car loan. So now that I see that it's soon possible to take this seriously... And uh, my brother told me about Bigger Pockets last week. I've listened to two episodes a day every single day. You guys are awesome. So, Neil, we appreciate that. And for all of our rookies that are listening, if you haven't yet, love to say five star review or an honest review on whatever plat uh, platform it is you're listening to, please do. The more reviews we get, the more folks we can reach, the more folks we can reach, the more folks we can help. Okay. So, let's go on to our next question from Zane Clark. Hello, has anyone structured a deal with seller financing in which you take over the mortgage for the seller? How does the seller benefit or recoup any of the equity they've already put into the house? Thank you for your time. So I think what they're, are they asking about seller financing or subject to? Yeah, I mean, he said seller finance, but maybe just creative financing in general is what, uh, what Zane's referring to. Okay, yeah, because he says take over the mortgage for the seller. So in the sense that you're taking over the mortgage for the seller, it's not really considered seller financing. Seller financing is when you are actually paying your monthly mortgage payment or however you're paying to the seller. They're actually holding the mortgage on it instead of the bank. But in this case, if you're taking over the seller's mortgage, then you are still paying a bank a mortgage and it's not technically seller financing. So in this scenario, um, the second part of the question was, how does the seller benefit or recoup any of the equity? Uh, Tony, have you ever done a subject to deal before? I have not. Um, we've had a couple under contract, but they they didn't quite work out. But um, if you are doing like a seller finance deal or maybe more so a subject to, um, you can still have the like between you and the seller negotiate like a down payment. So if the seller says, hey, I want 
20% down, then that's them kind of tapping into some of that equity that they have. Um, so yeah, there, there are kind of ways to structure it. But if you guys want like a, a full breakdown, I uh, actually still have the book right here, Wealth Without Cash, one of the newer Bigger Pockets books by our buddy Pace Morby. Um, he was on episode 280 recently of the, the Real Estate Rookie Show and kind of talked about all things subject to in seller finance and really just gave like a world class breakdown of, of what that looks like. Um, and then if you guys go to biggerpockets.com forward slash bookstore, you can pick up a copy of Pace's book, Wealth Without Cash as well. Yeah. And I guess to kind of give a quick answer to Zane's question is, how do they recoup the equity? Maybe they don't have any equity. And that is also part of the advantage to them is the reason they can't sell it is because nobody's willing to, to pay that price for it, that market price, or they just don't think that it would sell for all that, or they, for whatever reason, they don't have any equity in the property. And maybe they listed it with a real estate agent. Uh, Pace talks about how he really goes after expired listings. So um, you know, people tried to sell it. It didn't sell. And now you are the one coming in and solving their problem by retaking over their mortgage. You're purchasing the property from them. They can get out of that house and they can move on and do their next thing. So that's kind of the benefit is that maybe they got a new job somewhere else and they have to move. Um, so it's better than them, you know, having to pay money to pay their mortgage off. So if you went and say their property for easy math is, you know, they have a mortgage for $100,000. They try to sell it on MLS for one twenty. dollars They get offers at like $80,000. So that would mean they would have to come up with $20,000 to pay their mortgage. Um, and then you did the, sell, the proceeds from the sale, the $80,000 would go to pay off the other $80,000. But what you can do with subject two is you can go and offer to pay that hundred thousand. And you may be thinking, but wait, why would I pay 20 more than someone else is paying? Because right now interest rates have increased. So somebody else who's buying that same property, their mortgage might be 6%. But if that person bought the property, say in 2020, 2021, and their interest rate is only three and a half percent, your payment is going to be a lot lower and more affordable than that person who's can pay the 80,000. So uh, that's one huge advantage that Pace talks about too in his episode. So that's just a couple of the reasons why someone might sell and why you might be able to purchase the property at that purchase price of what their their mortgage is. Yeah. The, the levers you can pull are uh, your down payment, right? Uh, a lot of people can get into subject to or creative finance with zero, zero money out of pocket. Um, it's the term of the deal. Maybe it's a shorter note where it's like five years. Maybe it's long-term debt where it's 30 years, right? It all depends on what that person wants. Interest rate, like Ashley talked about, is another lever you can pull. And then the overall purchase price. And for a lot of sellers, they're going to have different motivations or, or not motivations per se, but each one of those is going to be important or more important to one person than the other. So it's up to you to kind of figure out what's really driving that person and then leveraging that to create the best deal. But I mean, yeah, we know people that are crushing it with a uh, creative finance and subject to. So um, it's about understanding that that seller's problems and then presenting some solutions that, that make it a one win for everybody. Yeah. Another example I give is I've done one subject to deal and it was to purchase a farm and they had back taxes that they couldn't afford to pay and they were also starting to fall behind on their mortgage payment. So they the property was going to be foreclosed on if they didn't come up with the cash to pay off the back taxes. So what we did was we worked out an arrangement with them where we took over their mortgage payments, we caught their mortgage payments up so they were no longer at risk of foreclosure, but now they still had the back taxes where they were at risk of the county coming in and taking the property. We paid off the back taxes, paying off the back taxes, catching them up on their mortgage, that was uh, less money than we would have needed as a down payment. Plus, this was this person's primary residence, so their mortgage terms were a lot better. The payment was a lot lower than what we would have had to pay if we went and got our own financing. Uh, the benefit to the seller was they weren't going to lose the property to a foreclosure where that would be on their record. Um, they also, we let them rent the house. So they live in the house and pay rent to us. So we didn't have to go find a tenant. They live there, they pay rent. Um, so they got to stay in their house even, and we just use the farmland. And there's two other rental properties on there too, that are rented out. But so 
There's always different ways that you could make it a win-win scenario for each buyer and seller. Okay, next up, we have a question from Jared Sutherland. What are the advantages, disadvantages of getting a buy and hold in a historic district? Thanks. Have you ever bought in, in a historic district? No, I haven't. Um, there is this church that bought the movie theater in a small town near me. And they bought two building, buildings adjacent to it. And they were going to tear the one building down to make a larger parking lot for the movie. Actually, a parking lot. There's only street parking for the movie theater now. And they got stopped by the historic district and said, no, you can't tear this, this building down. I had toured that building probably five years ago when it was first up for sale. There was a three unit. In one of the units, there it was a two bedroom unit, and there was eight people living in it. um, Mattresses on the floor in the living room. The other unit, uh, two other the other two units were vacant. One just like needed a lot of repairs. The other unit had um, in the bathroom, like above the bathtub, were pieces of plywood with chains and hooks so that you could fold the plywood down like bunk beds. This was all through the house graffiti needles and had been like a, a drug house basically where people would go in and do drugs and stay over on one of the plywood bunk beds. But, um, yeah, so like it was definitely in need of a ton of repair and just like it, uh, it's the building just sits there now. It hasn't been demolished. It hasn't been fixed up or anything. And it's just, it's to me, it's very, controversial as to like, how do they decide what's historic? How do they decide? So I honestly don't know a lot about like purchasing in a historic district or like the board members. So my advice would be to um, look at what, if there are any tax advantages, if there are any grants or funds that the historic board will help you get, because there are tons of, um, funding out there and grants that you can get for all types of things, but you have to most likely to be really successful at getting them is hire a grant writer, which can cost a lot of money. I used to be on the board for a boys and girls club for about 10 years. And we would always go do these grants. And finally we just got a grant writer to join our board because we weren't having like any luck. But once we had like a grant writer and we're investing in that to come and and, and make it, we are getting a lot more grants coming in. So that I could see as one advantage of doing a buy and hold in the historic district. Yeah, it's a, it's a great call out. And I, I haven't purchased anything in, in like a historic district either, but uh, a friend of mine, her name's Katie Neeson, K-A-T-I-E Neeson. And you guys should follow her on Instagram. She's Katie Develops and she lives in Bryan, Texas. And she's basically like on this mission to restore downtown Bryan, Texas, and she's buying old beat up buildings and repurposing them, uh, repurposing them into mixed use commercial facilities. Um, and she's doing a really great job. So I know she knows a lot about like buying in historic districts and what that, what the benefits are. But like you said, Ashley, when I was investing in Shreveport, um, their like local government was also encouraging people to buy homes in downtown and uh, renovate them as well. And like you said, they were giving tax incentives to people who were um, buying and renovating properties in that downtown area, um, you know, assuming that you were using it for like whatever purposes that they they had approved it for. So there's a lot of, um, you know, potential benefits of doing that. And it's cool, you know, like I think my, my short-term rental hat, like kind of putting that on, like if you're able to buy like whatever, like a historic bed and breakfast, or like you said, actually like an old movie theater, like who would have thought that you could buy a movie theater? Um, but being able to buy some of these properties in, in these historic parts of town, there is a marketability to that. So like if you bought that old thing and turned it into this really cool Airbnb, um, now you've got something that's going to kind of stand out um, in that neighborhood. So I talked about Katie Neeson. If you guys want to hear more from Katie, she was on episode 538 of the Bigger Pockets Real Estate Podcast. And uh, like I said, she's a a really amazing person, funny as heck. Um, and she does redevelopment in uh, Bryan, Texas, all in the downtown kind of historic area. So episode 538, if you want to hear more from Katie. Okay. And our last question today is from Brandy Joe Kroom, a Burr refinance question. 
Have you recently refinanced based on the asset itself and the rental income and what kind of rates and discount points are you paying? Is this a portfolio loan or are you refinancing where they take into account all your personal income and debt and qualify based on that? So Tony, we I don't know if we talked about this in this episode or the last episode, but you haven't done any refinances lately. When was the last time that you did one? Yeah, it was a while ago. But I'm actually working on one right now. And I think it plays in perfectly to this question because I'm working with two lenders and one is called uh, an investor loan. Um, and even though it's called an investor loan, it's still in my personal name. And they are looking at DTI and my you know, tax returns and all this other stuff to make sure that I can qualify. And then I'm working with the second lender that's using a DSCR product. So it's called the debt service coverage ratio product. And, um, you know, and obviously I told both lenders that I'm working with both of them and I'm just going to go with whoever kind of gives me the, the best deal here. Um, but you can go either route, Brandy, which is the beauty of, of investing in real estate. So your first question is, you know, can you do it based on the asset itself and the rental income? Um, so yes, you can totally do that. That's what the DSCR loan product is. And a lot of lenders will underwrite that property and say, how much rental income do we think this property will generate? And does the rental income uh, meet or exceed the debt obligations or the mortgage payment of that property? And if it does, then the chances of you getting approved for that DSCR product, there it, it's it's better, right? You have a better chance of getting approved. Now, typically the the interest rates are higher. So on the DSCR product right now, I'm getting quoted like a nine. Um, on the investor product, I'm getting quoted like a like a seven. Um, so you are going to pay more for the product. But again, if your ability to get approved for a traditional loan, this looking at your DTI, your income and all that stuff is limited, then going the DSCR route tends to be a little bit better. Um, I'd say that the LCVs are about the same. I think both of them are around like 75%. Uh, I want to say. So that doesn't change too much, but you are paying more upfront um, with the DSCR products than you are with the traditional investor loans. So I'm doing um, two refinances right now, or I fin- just finished the one and that was a short-term rental and we did it on the commercial side, but they did not ac- take into account what our short-term rental income would be because we hadn't had it active at the time that we started the refinance, we were still finishing up the rehab. So Tony, in in your experience for doing them for short-term rentals, are you going to specific lenders that understand short-term rental income or what should I do differently going forward? Because when they sent the appraiser out, the appraiser was just there to appraise the property and not do any kind of income approach. So there's two options. So your first option is to hold on to the property for at least about six months um, and show that you have short-term rental income on that property. And most lenders I've talked to said that if they can see at least six months of documented income, then they can use that to kind of project out what that property would do on a year. And if you've had it for a year and it shows up on your tax return, then that's the easiest way because then they can just look at that tax return and say, how much money did this property generate? So even if the lender doesn't really understand short-term rentals, if you have a long enough paper trail to show how that property is actually performing, I've, I've, lenders that I've talked to or spoken with have uh, said that that's a, that's a decent route to go down. The other option is to work with the lender that actually understands and offers DSCR products specific to the short-term rental industry and who have the ability to underwrite the property, not just as a long-term rental, but as a short-term rental as well. And that's the, the kind of lender that I'm working with right now. There's someone who specializes in the short-term rental space for DSCR products. Okay. Awesome. That's why I love that we get to be co-hosts of the show because I always get to pick your brain on everything short term rental that I don't <laughs> <Yeah>. know. <laughs> yeah. So you got options out there. Yeah, I'll have another one. They'll probably be I'll be doing this fall. So yeah, I'll have to consider which would be the best. Look at you turn into like a little short term Airbnb queen over here, huh? I d- you would be so proud of me. I just hired a, like an operations manager, like someone to handle the day to day. There you go. I love yeah, that. we had a her third day we had um, uh, have the septic pumped at one of the properties and it was so relaxing. 
for me. I had to do nothing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and that's so funny because we're we're actually on the inverse where our operations manager actually her last day was last Friday. So she she moved on to another role somewhere else. Um so now, you know, me and Sarah having to kind of step back into the the operations, at least in the short term, while we try and source someone else. So it's like um and actually have a my ops calls right after this with uh with our VAs to try and keep everything keep everything moving. So I'm I'm glad you're enjoying uh that process and hopefully I can I can get back there soon enough. What what a great way for you to come back to vacation. Having totally more yeah. <laughs> yeah, having more work to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us for this week's Rookie Reply. I'm Ashley at Wealth From Rentals and he's Tony at Tony J. Robinson on Instagram. Don't forget to check out the Real Estate Rookie YouTube and we will see you guys on Wednesday where we will have a guest. Still